Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to SoCal Loopers Now Worldwide. Uh, it's the place you come to learn about loop, about closed loops, about managing your health with diabetes and looping. And today we have, it's pretty exciting today. Um, we have three speakers today who come from the um, USC Westside Center for Diabetes under the auspices of Dr. Ann Peters. So we have Mary Rose Dureco, Mark Hormel, and Meg Moretta, who are gonna talk about how they manage loop patients and televisits. Uh, so let me go to our usual uh, disclaimer. Um, which we make you all pay attention to every single time. The Loop app is a do-it-yourself closed loop algorithm and user interface developed through the work of community volunteers. While it may seem obvious, please consult with your healthcare professionals regarding your diabetes management. And we have three healthcare professionals on today. Uh, important, please understand that this project is highly experimental and is not FDA approved for therapy, therefore, you take full responsibility for building and running the system for yourself, and you do so at your own risk. Just kind of nod, say, yes, I understand, and we can move on. So I'm going to stop the share, but I will introduce our speakers tonight. Um, we have with us Mary Rose Duraco, who is an RN, BSN, and CDE. Uh, she's been in the field for 31 years. Uh, managing and working in diabetes care with a diverse background in clinical diabetes, nutrition, fitness, medical device, and pharmaceutical industry uh, events and clinical and education programs. She's co-authored several publications with Dr. Ann Peters uh, on the management, insulin management algorithms for clinical care of diabetes and books on diabetes for both patients and medical providers. Um, and she works out of the USC Westside for Diabetes. Along with Mary Rose today, we have Mark Carmel, Master of Public Health, CDE, or it's now called CDCES. Uh, he provides diabetes education and is the coordinator of research studies from the Westside office. He also manages ongoing TrialNet and T1D exchange registries and TrialNet studies. That's an interesting person to follow. And then we also have Meg Moretto, who is a registered dietitian and a CDE with over 26 years of experience in diabetes care. So we're loaded with diabetes care today. Uh, Meg is dedicated to educating her patients on the importance of a healthy approach to diet and why a balanced lifestyle is vital to healthy aging and diabetes self-management. It, it's a powerhouse of people talking to us. We're very honored to have our guests here today. And I'm going to turn this over to Mary Rose and thank you so much for being here. And, um, so Cal Loopers for inviting us. So my name is Mary Rose Taraco. I'm a, a, a nurse um, and I have spent my entire career um, working with insulin pumps and type 1 diabetes. Um, I'm honored to be here with my two colleagues, Meg Moretta and Mark Harmel. And when we thought about how we should title this talk, we thought we're all in this together. You know, um, we know that people on loop feel as though they're alone in this. Um, there are very few providers and educators that work with loop and um, diabetes care and education specialists. We're here to support, educate, and help you through, get a broader perspective of how you're doing. And we hope that we can um, share with you how we are working with our patients with loop. Um, and so uh, through telehealth, uh, our center is a very comprehensive center. Um, I'm the coordinator of the education program, um, but we have uh, two endocrinologists, a nurse a specialist, nurse practitioner, who's a diabetes educator. Uh, we have a primary care provider. Uh, we have four diabetes care and education specialists, and Mark heads up our research team. Um, we are in the heart of Beverly Hills, but because of our telehealth program that we started about a year and a half ago, we're able to reach out to the greater community in, um, in, in California. Um, so diabetes care and education specialists are behavioral health practitioners. So we help patients, we coach patients 
in diabetes self-management behaviors. There's seven self-management behaviors. I'm not sure if you're all aware of them, um, but we help educate and support patients in those behaviors. Um, we're covered by medical insurance um, and even Medicare uh, within a certified program. We are ADA certified, our program, and we just renewed our certification. Um, if you meet with a diabetes care and education specialist that's a dietitian, that uh, does not need to be within a certified program, um, and it is covered by uh, health insurance. And every year you get a certain amount of hours. You could call your insurance company to find out how many hours you get. Um, the goal of our education program is to offer education and support on innovative solutions for patients and families living with diabetes. We are primarily a type one practice, um, and many of those type ones are on insulin pumps and medical devices. So we see ourselves as a technology focused um, specialty type one center. Um, so there's much technology going on in our clinic and we are using remote monitoring through telehealth. We did it way before the pandemic started. And so we are very comfortable doing it. I would say 95% of our patients are telehealth now. So, um, but before that, I would say about 40, 30% of my patients were doing telehealth visits, uh, especially pump patients on loop. Um, our philosophy is patient directed and goal focused and led by the patient and collaborative with our patients. So um, our philosophy about loop has changed over the years. So um, we feel as though we're all learning it together. It's not FDA approved. Um, we do not prescribe it. You do it at your own risk. Um, but we're learning just as much from our loopers as they are from us. So our long decades long pump experience and your experience with the device, uh, you know, we're the perfect team to teach each other. Um, so once uh, a patient does decide to take the initiative and go on loop, we offer support and help uh, with, with using loop safely. Um, and, and we feel as though after the build, it's very easy and intuitive. Um, so our history with Loop is that uh, before June of last year, I wasn't really talking about it much. If a patient came in, we helped them a bit with settings. We looked at blood sugars with them. Um, but then after I attended the ADA last year, um, I really was um, excited and educated that I could start to really uh, help start helping patients a little bit more with it. So um, now I, uh, and for the last year, um, I have been discussing it as an option, not a prescription, but an option when I present pumps to a patient, whether it be a new patient to pump therapy or someone that's considering an upgrade to another system. Um, I offer a lot more help. Uh, um, I, I have a lot more experience. I've started many, many patients on it over the past year, year and a half. And so now I can share a lot of my experience with new people considering loop. I've had some experience with um, coaching people through builds that are having difficult times. And I was a novice myself. So I've learned by trial and error, just as, as you guys are learning. Um, so I give them general information about what I've learned about the build. Um, so I have true tracks to helping people with loop. Um, either they're new to pump therapy completely and they come to me and they're interested. Um, and what I'll do is I'll work with Meg, who is our uh, dietitian, and we start with pre-pump education. We get that patient ready for a pump, carb counting, basal versus bolus, teaching them about glucagon, um, looking into all the different options for pumps, we, we, we choose an infusion set or the pod, we, we practice, uh, we get into, you know, difficult meals and things like that. Um, we set up tide pool, we start doing some remote monitoring with tide pool. And tide pool, there's a way to do notes to each other and teach each other remotely and, um, and go back and forth with each other and communicate. And then they start on their pump. Once they start on their pump, I optimize their settings with them and then it, when they're ready, they get into the build. 
And then once they get into the build, I do a loop start um, visit with them where I help them with safe settings, okay? Um, and then after that, we do uh, some remote follow-up just to optimize settings and everything. So then uh, current pumpers come to me. They're interested. They're ready to throw away their old Medtronic pumps or their other pumps, and they want to get started. Um, and they're very interested in loop. We get them started on tide pool if they're not already using tide pool. Um, most of our patients are already using tide pool when they come to me. And a lot of them, um, I do recommend they get off of their old paradigm pumps because we've had a lot of problems with those old pumps. And we usually put them on, on the pod. Uh, and then once they get on the pod, there is maybe a couple of weeks of optimizing settings because I do find that once they get on a pod, a lot of times they need less insulin because the pot is pumping directly into the site. So I just massage their settings a little bit. They go out and they do the build, come back, and we do that loop start. And then I follow them up to uh, look at the broader perspective and, and refine their settings with them uh, and do some remote monitoring. And so those are the two tracks. And then I break down the build for people. I just kind of give them my experience. I use a lot of the the directions for the build that come from the loop and I just remind them how long it's going to take each step. We have a little cheat sheet. Uh, remind them to buy two Riley links. Remind them to read every little detail of every little thing um, to pay for the developer, not get the free one. You know, just little mistakes that people have made along the way that have taught me. Um, I I tell them, you know, this is all do it yourself. There's no resource guide. Loop Docs is your resource guide. You don't get one of those little manuals. Um, your Facebook and your Zelp chat are your tech support. I am not tech support. You do not want me to be your tech support. And then I make them all, or I don't make them. I highly suggest they get a mentor on Facebook uh, or maybe a mentor um, that focuses on builds or someone their own age, or just, you know, look for somebody to start talking to um, so they can get the mentorship that you guys give them on your Facebook groups, because I think it's amazing. Um, uh, and then we set up a loop setting appointment. It's about an hour long. And we do that once they have the app on their phone and Dexcom streaming through, then we get started together and we do this now through telehealth. Um, so these visits, the loop start visit is where I do the safe pump settings because the settings from a regular pump do not necessarily translate perfectly into loop settings. There are a few other settings in there that, um, that regular pumps don't have. Uh, we talk about oh we go through the operate tab on loop docs and how to operate the app um, uh, I teach them how to make um, the incident report um, and how a lot of them don't even know how to do a Facebook post. So I teach them how to post a troubleshooting post on the Facebook. Um, we go over the backup insulin and glucose that they need to have uh, for their emergency kit. I do some customized override settings with them and we talk about best practices. This is the list I give them. Um, all of our um, patients uh, on loop carry backup insulin, carry strips and pots and res extra reservoirs and extra batteries, um, an extra PDM and a Dexcom receiver just in case, um, uh, chargers, glucose tabs and gels, protein snacks, uh, medic ID is either in their phone or on their body. Um, and they all have a pump failure plan. So they know what their backup insulin plan is if loop or their pump fails. Um, some of the customized override settings that I work with patients to start with and to refine over time are settings for their cardio, weight strength training, a different setting for competition sometimes, like tennis games and things like that. Um, uh, alcohol nights where they drink uh, a considerable amount of alcohol, uh, PMS, customized overrides, illness, and steroid overrides. 
and uh, we try them out, we work on tide pool, we evaluate them and we refine them over time. So this is one of the things that I start with um, and then as they come in for follow-up, we work on it, on refining these settings. And then I go over breast practices. Uh, I would say the number one most important thing that I tell people is to pre-bolus and to try to use your pre-meal target. And getting that insulin into your body before the food goes in is really helpful. Uh, a lot of reminders about the peak action of the insulin and getting that insulin in before you start to eat really helps to match the glucose peak with the insulin peak. Um, we, we work a lot with apps and carb counting. Um, and I remind people that this loop is, uh, and any other closed loop system or pump that you use is only as accurate as the carb count that you put into it for the meal bolus, right? Um, I also have a problem a lot with people over treating their lows on Dexcom or on any kind of sensor because of the lag time. So I try to encourage people when they do treat a low to do a finger stick confirmation um, before they keep on treating and treating and to remind people on closed loop pumps that sometimes you need less insulin to treat a low than you did on non closed loop um, because the pump does suspend. Um, so, uh, reacting to highs, I try to encourage them to give the device a chance to correct their highs for them. So I can see how our settings are performing the week later. If they intervene all the time, then I can't see how the, uh, the, uh, algorithm is, is performing. Um, and then, uh, carrying backup supplies. And then we go over the 250 times two rule, which is the rule for when to troubleshoot pump failure when you're high to prevent diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, so then we get into follow-up. I usually follow up with my, loop, my new loop patient a week afterward. Uh, occasionally we talk back and forth within the first few days to answer questions or concerns. I always tell them, reach out to me if you're having lows or you know long duration highs or something like that. Uh, by email, but usually about a week later, we follow up. Um, we use screen share on my telehealth portal. It's really nice. And we look at their tide pool data. We get a retrospective view of everything. They get to step back and get a broader perspective of the, their diabetes instead of getting caught in the minutia of one meal, one high blood sugar, one low blood sugar. So they step back. We look at their glucose data, how's your time and range, what's your percentage of lows, what are your trends. And um, the nice thing about Tide Pool is the patient can leave me little notes. I tried my exercise profile, I played tennis, it didn't work, look at this. Or, oh, I ate at, you know, Mexican food and I tried that, you know, uh, the carb count we talked about it, it didn't work, hey, check it out here. And when they leave me a little sticky pad note on Tide Pool, I can read it, it's right next to their data and we can discuss it when we meet. Um, we talk about other diabetes self-management behaviors that we can see on Tide Pool on the dailies, their pre-bolusing behaviors, they're treating the lows, how they're treating highs, how their exercise is working. Um, we go over settings and overrides, we might make some adjustments. Um, and then we're, I'm always asking about sites and um, talking about infusion sets and helping to make an assessment for um, site overuse. Um, and then we, do, we get into goal setting and we set up an appointment for follow-up for the next one. This is a little example of what my telehealth uh, portal looks like, uh, where I can sh look at one week of data over a, a retrospective view here, kind of pull out where there might be some patterns, and then we know how to, to, to focus the visit. Um, and then we get into the dailies, which shows these are my little sticky pad notes. This might have a meal with the carb count on it. This might say, oh, I exercised and look, I went low afterwards. Come on, we got to work on this. Or, you know, the timing of the bolus compared to the meal. Um, we can look at all kinds of nice data here on the bottom. Mark Carmel is going to give a really nice um, talk on this next. Um, 
And this is the way we kind of look at the daily diabetes self-management behaviors and we set goals and we see what we can work on here together. Um, and then uh, we spend a little time usually, you know, checking out their pump sites. It's hard for me to know I'm talking to a group of pumpers without talking to you about rotating your site. So important if you overuse your site again and again, the insulin will cause what we call call lipohypertrophy, which is swelling and scarring underneath the tissue, and then it affects insulin absorption. So be sure that you check your sites, look for redness, uh, discoloration, swelling, lumpiness. Those are signs of site overuse. And be sure that you talk to your educator about rotating your sites and what which sites you could use. Um, and then I'm gonna stop talking for a minute here and I am going to turn it over to uh, Meg Moretta, who is our dietitian, who can talk about some of, of the counseling that she does through telehealth with our loop patients. There's some questions that are coming in, so you may want to address some of the questions and then loop uh, Meg in. Okay, I'll jump in. Um, starting with, um, what apps do you like for carb counting? Oh, yes. I'd love to talk about apps for carb counting. Meg might want to chime in on this, too. Um, I love Figui for a, a visual uh, portion estimator, a carb counting estimator. Uh, it's really nice, like if you went to Denny's or something and put a little cantaloupe on your plate, and you're like, I have no idea what to count this at. You can look up at Figui, F-I-G-W-E-E, -E, and you search for cantaloupe. You press on it and it shows a little bit of cantaloupe on a plate and then you scroll up and it makes the portion larger on the plate. And as that portion expands, the carb count changes down below. So it's really nice for a visual estimate. Um, I love my fitness pal for diary logging. So the cool thing about my fitness pal, I think it's the largest database online is that once you look up breakfast, you never have to look it up again. You just say you ate it under breakfast and it logs it for you forever. So you don't have to keep on looking it up. And then all your snacks you put under snacks. And then, so you can just go like spend a couple hours and just look up everything you, you eat and you'll just have it there in a log for you. Um, so that's my fitness pal. Then there is Siri for when you're in a pinch. Hey Siri, how many carbs are in a sweet potato? Boom. You know, Siri will look it up for you and verbally tell it back to you. Mm -hmm. um, and Siri looks everything up on Calorie King. Calorie King is that good old little book we carried around for decades, right? Um, and now it's online and there's an app for Calorie King. So those are my three favorites. Meg, do you have anything else that you like? Um, no, you kind of mentioned them all. Um, I really like the Calorie King because it allows you to adjust um, the portions um, that you are currently eating and it, then it'll adjust like the amount of carbohydrates in that portion. So it's not, you know, Good if it point. says, you know, you're ha having a cup and then you just put that in because otherwise it's going to be a specific, um, you know, the usual exchange system type thing. So I really like the calorie King, um, the app that is because you can make adjustments um, and, and be a lot more closer to, to what you're eating in terms of carbohydrates. Right. Yeah. I'm going to come back to your, your emergency kit that you uh, help your patients do. Do you give them a kit? Because I would sign up to be your patient if I got a kit. <laughs> well, gosh, <laughs> it's hard to give you anything on telehealth now. So, um, I'll pay yeah. no, I don't give them. Uh, you know. uh, what, what branches do you work with for loop? I like the master branch if it isn't a techie that's into the coding and all the Glenn stuff, right? So um, we do have a lot of young um, non-carb eaters. <laughs> Meg and I don't understand them, but we work with them. They do really well on the auto bolus because they eat very low carb meals. I do have a guy on auto bolus right now that's not doing so great because he likes carbs, you know, and he likes the bad ones. So um, that might not be the best one for him. But um, yeah, we've, we've people on all different branches. 
Okay. And um, when you do your beginner training, do you have videos of what you do? Pardon me? You have videos of what you do? Have you set up any beginner videos? No. No. Uh, no, I work with my patients one-on-one -on -one, uh, through telehealth right now. Yeah. Uh, I use a lot of videos in my training. You know, so if I'm teaching someone in pen or I'm teaching them an infusion set, I have a lot of instructional videos. I teach everyone back semi now. I spent my whole day teaching back semi. I use an instructional video for that, and I screen share a lot of videos during my trainings with my one-on-one -on -one patient. All righty. And then I mean, you're, you're building fans here. Do you take patients on out of state? Of California. No, right now we we are only um, licensed to work in California. Okay, uh, Dr. Peters, what, what at what age will she take on patients? Is she all ages or is she just uh, adults? It's primarily adults. Mark, I, you might be able to talk to that a little bit better than I can. I don't know that she really takes it that many adults. There's an occasional, usually there's somebody who's an athlete, mm -hmm. sort of like, you know, high school athlete and, and Dr. Peters has a lot of experience working with athletes. And so somebody who is 15 and on, you know, on the verge of being the state cross country champ or something like that, who happens to have diabetes. And so, you know, Often she'll get her arm twisted, but generally it's 18 and above in the office is sort of designed for that. Okay, a few more questions and then we'll let you move on. Um, well, how do you do update, updates for Loop and Mac and Xcode or developer license? We, this is all up to you and your Loop mentor and your Loop community. We um, are not your tech support we are experts in pumps. We do not prescribe this device. This is a do-it-yourself kind of thing. If you call me and you, you know, the Riley Link fell in the toilet or something, <laughs> I, I'll help you, you know, get on Loop Docs and talk you through how to set up your new Riley Link or change your transmitter ID. You know, I can help a little bit with that kind of stuff. But honestly, I am not tech support and I don't get, I don't go that far. Okay. But I, I'm very good at helping you keep a broader perspective, look at your diabetes and where the trends are and how we can use diabetes self-management to improve your control and time and range and improve your quality of life. And I'm great at massaging settings and things like that, but um, I am not a coder and a techie expert. Okay, you know, questions are coming in faster than I can keep up. Um, how often are patients coming in uh, with loop setting adjustment questions and um, which settings are being adjusted most often? This is a great question. Thank you for that. So we've had some people come to us on some pretty scary settings. This is why I developed this whole, hey man, if you're gonna go on it, please just come in and talk to me first. You know, um, so we've had people come in with their suspend uh, their suspend threshold at like 50, you know, you really want to suspend way before you get to 50, right? We've had their basal rates all not set right, you know, and these are not our patients. They just got on there, didn't read all the details. Katie DeSimone does a beautiful job with setting lessons and things like that. I, you know, so I think the thing that people need most when they're starting on a closed loop is that carb ratio usually needs to change, okay? And we saw this on the Medtronic 670G as well, that we found we needed to make the carb ratios a little bit more aggressive before they got started. I look at people's settings before, even our patients before they start on loop because sometimes we've overset a few things to compensate for their inadequate carb counting. Mm -hmm. But now Loop's gonna compensate for your inadequate carb counting. So you might not need that high basal rate you have there from dinner to bedtime anymore. Do you see what I'm saying? So I do some weight-based dosing and I compare it to their total daily dose and then I compare it to their settings and we do this whole optimization thing 
before we even start on loop. So, um, okay, I, knew, I told you you'd get the question. Um, it, if you go to an endocrinologist who is supporting loop, um, do you take your tide pool data or night scout data, which is better for you to see from your patients? We like tide pool. Tide pools in the, the format that we're, our eyeballs are used to looking at. We love the standardized look and feel of tide pool in our practice. That would be a personal choice that I would ask your endocrinologist, um, but I'm voting that they're going to say tide pool. Actually, we see a lot of endocrinologists that really just use clarity. They don't really have a fuller sense of the whole system. Um, questions about FIASP and LUMGEV. Are you seeing a lot of use of that? Well, those are off-label um, insulins for insulin pumps. So I don't prescribe pumps. I don't prescribe insulin. Um, I think they're looking like they might get approved, especially LUMGEV. I've looked at a couple of the phase three studies. I, you know, I, we do have some people using them off label, um, but, uh, you know, I don't see a huge difference. And Mark, I don't know if you can talk about that, but, um, and so I wouldn't recommend using anything off label without your doctor's expertise and, you know, knowledge. Um, so that's kind of my feel about it. I, I'm excited that maybe faster acting insulins will come out because I think that's the missing um, piece to this is that the insulin doesn't work fast enough. So pre-bolus, pre-bolus, pre-bolus. Okay, and what about Afreza? Do you have users using Afreza and how do you account for that in loop? Yeah, I wouldn't talk about that because that's off the label as well and I think it's a little risky. Um, I wouldn't. Present it. off label? Yeah, with a, well, to use it with a pump. Huh. Um, I, especially a pump that remembers your insulin on board, I just, I wouldn't know how to advise anybody on that. I think you might need to turn off uh, your closed loop because it's not going to know that you just took that aphrasia, right? So it doesn't know that that insulin's on board. So I would just think the risk of hypoglycemia is something that I just, I personally don't want to get into giving anybody an advice about that. Alrighty. And any tips for low carb and not using autobolus? Low carb and not using autobolus? Oh, yeah. I think a low carb diet is a great diet. Um, and you would just put your carbs right into your pump and bolus for it. Okay, and I just I wanted to throw in when you had your chart of uh, places you can rotate your sights. Um, the upper shoulder shoulder blade is fabulous. It's generally not used, um, and many of us are beginning to go to it because the absorption is fabulous because it's never been touched. It doesn't. Well, as long as you have fat, Joanne, and you're over there, but insulin is supposed to it'll get absorbed a little better in fat. It's, it's, it's pretty cool because most people don't use that area. So it's not. Yeah, and, right. And peop, a lot of people don't use other areas too. So I think it's important that they rotate their sites. Yes. I brought my little guy just in case we needed a, a little, <laughs> a, you know, model for site rotation. Does he have a name? Uh, I would just uh, call him the guy with the sights. <laughs> Meg has a really great one for lipohypertrophy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, th I think I've caught up on the questions. Meg? Yes. Okay, so um, just again, that you know, using tide pool is probably one of the most important things, um, especially in the beginning, so you can really track what you're doing if you. Um, what you ate, if you exercise, if, if you had a stressful conversation, anything that's going to make any difference. That's why type is so great that you can log, log it. And then again, we could communicate back and forth if needed. Um, the other thing that I teach is the glycemic index. Um, even though it's not 
you know, approve, uh, ADA doesn't approve it as a teaching tool. I find it's very helpful um, when you start, why they don't, why they don't want it as a teaching tool is because when you, most people don't eat, eat one single food at a time, they usually eat it in, in multiples. Like you have some carb, you have some protein, you have some fat. So then the glycemic response is going to be different. But the glycemic index does show you foods that have a much better response and they tend to be a little bit healthier as well. So I, I definitely like using the glycemic index and teaching people how to choose those foods more. Um, and if they're using the other ones, how can they, you know, the setting must be, they have to use a different setting for that. Um, I work a lot with carb ratios and those can be um, adjusted uh, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, I do a lot of looking at why it's so important for logging because I can see exactly how many grams of carbohydrate, what was actually absorbed, and then what happened. So it's really helpful, again, um, logging things. I'm a big fan of logging. Um, and same thing with the insulin um, counteraction effects. Um, the bowl thing for different meals um, is a little bit tricky. To, it's just everything's really dependent on that, that individual and how they eat. And then we work a lot with um, meal composition. And we also work with like how much protein and fat and fiber do you have in the meal? Because that's going to change how our body breaks it down. Um, so we work a lot with that. So that's kind of where, what I do. Yeah. And I think it, you know, people get tired of logging because no one looks at their log. I do. <laughs> but Maggie and I look at your logs. Yes. Uh, we, we love to see it on Tide Pool. We love to see the meal is in this little stick yeah. note that Mark will show you. You know, it's right there over your sensor data, right over where your bolus was given. So we see the timing of the meal. We see the mm -hmm. meal. We see what you counted it at. Um, we see if you overrode your pump. So it's really nice, the tide pool. Yeah. So um, we really use it to counsel and communicate remotely with patients. We love it, right? Yes. So if that's all Meg has to share, oh, that's ready for the next presentation. I'm going to stop screen sharing, Mark, if you're ready. Yes, you can stop your screen sharing. So I'm doing two things in the clinic now. Um, number one, I am now preparing patients for telemedicine visits. And so I'm reaching out to patients in advance. I'm collecting data. And, you know, we have loop, loop patients. And so we have to collect loop data. So I'm going to be talking about tide pool and collecting data for tide pool. And the other part that I'm doing is I'm not in charge of doing clinical trials. So I get to, to play with some new toys. And the trial that we're most recruiting for, if any of you are out there between 18 and 30, but we need you to we need people with an A1C above 7.5. And so sometimes our loopers are, you know, have A1C lower than that. Yeah, I don't see anyone under 30 yet out there. And maybe some of them. Sarah maybe is 30-ish. Anyway, so that, that's the, the trial that we're really rec recruiting for right now. So I'll jump in and go to my talk. So we're talking about reviewing the data, and I'll talk a little bit about targets and more about how to read your target data. And one of the questions that came up that I saw was about what's, what's the target. So we'll talk about what a target is and where that came from. And so the Libre View has done a really good job of using the AGP report. And so that's known as the Ambulatory Glucose Report. And so in Lead Review picked it up, and so there was this group, and it's uh, led by the International Diabetes Center in Minneapolis, Rich, Rich Birkenstall, and he's put together a, you know, an international consortium and said, you know, we need to standardize times and range, and especially for people who are doing clinical trials, you have to say, you know, what works and what is low and what is very low and what do you call those things? 
And so there was arm wrestling. And do you say low? Do you say very low? Or, or do you say extremely low? You know, where, where do you do it? And so they've come up with times in ranges. And so the target range is 70 to 180. And people will say, well, that's sort of where, you know, a normal person with diabetes is going to float in through that. And so it also translates if you, it's sort of, there's a nice translation where if you're 70% 70 time and range, that sort of translates into an A1C of seven. And so, you know, you got those nice seven numbers together and the target for you know, most people with, with type one diabetes. And if we see a seven, we're sort of happy. In this case, somebody has, uh, so the other, number is this glucose management indicator number. And I'm not seeing my mouse floating around, so I can't point, so I'm sorry for that. So you can see there's average glucose, glucose management indicator, and glucose variability. So those are the other numbers that we're looking at. And so you see that the glucose management indicator, also known as the GMI, that's sort of the equivalent now and we're using a lot now that we're doing telemedicine we're not doing finger pricks of people's a1c when they walk into the, the clinic we're looking at their glucose management indicator so this person is 6.1 percent but also take a look at how, how many lows they have you know six percent between 54 and 69 and one percent that's very low and and the, the variability is ups and downs. Well, I'll show you what that ups and down is. And the target for that is we want a number less than 36. So this person has lower variability, but they're having a, a, a number of lows. And so we would take a look at that. And here's sort of that same data. And there's the cloud view. And that's what's up above, and you can see where they're above and below. You know, you can certainly see the times that they're below 70. We worry less about the time, and it starts at midnight at one end, and then midnight at the other end, and that 12 p.m. in the middle is noon. And so we see, like, after lunch, sometimes they're going a little bit low. We worry less about that than the nighttime lows. And then down below, you see little squiggly plots. And you'll see a mix of what I call the roller coaster days. And especially you can look at Thursday the third and where there's an up and a down. And so we have a high and a low sort of, you know, dose late, you know, or you know, sometimes there's pump issues, shot issues that didn't work. And then came crashing down, overcorrected, and then, you know, was trying to stabilize, whereas someday, like the 10th or even the 31st, is like in the first, are you know, more ideal, sort of in that time and range of between 70 and 180, and in this case, it's the gray area, with, with not a whole lot of variability. So that's what we look for. We try to get you to have more good flat days and fewer up and down days. So we look at variability, we look at reducing your loads. And so here's what 6.8 looks like. This is an old Dexcom tracing. And this has low variability and not a lot of ups and downs in through here. And then here is 6.9 with a very high variability as well. And so that's why we start looking at A1C less because A1C, you know, it's about the same, 6.8, 6.9. Normally, if we were just looking at the A1C, we would celebrate and say, you're having a great job. And then, but when you look at this data, you want that 6.8 rather than this 6.9. And we try to help get you there. Here is the Dexcom data, and most of you are using the Dexcom with the loop. And this is the Dexcom uh, Clarity Report, and this is the AGP report. Again, and it looks a little bit different. And up here, you have the different times and ranges. 
And so you see the time and target range. Again, you have in the middle that 70 to 180 and the low and very low and high. Some standardized numbers, standardized buckets. And we like looking at data in these standardized buckets. So we do a quick glance at this. And so we see the big cloud picture down below in that shaded area with the little hashtags, that's between 70 and 180. We like looking at data from that. We want to know if somebody is low or not. And so we see this person is rarely low. And so, you know, we like that time and target range is 71%. And then Dexcom has their GMI number on, on a different page, sort of the overview page. So you have to do some digging around in these different reports. And there's two different ways to talk about glucose variability. One is the coefficient variation and the standard deviation. I think I highlight that. Oh, there we go. And so that's where the variability is. And again, this is below that 36% target. What's nice with the Libra report, it shows the target. And this one doesn't show, it just shows the number. And so different ways of different reports, and you can see this report on your phone, or you can set up Dexcom Clarity so that it emails you this report every Sunday. So a lot of people do that because they like looking at their data. They like looking at the reports, and they like comparing their data from last week to this week. And so that's something that you can do. And so this is what, you know, again, high variability. You see that, again, we're looking at for the most part, coefficient of the variation, and this is 43%. That other one was 30%. See lots of highs, lots of lows, and, you know, this has person less time and range. And so, you know, that's the reason for, for doing looping is to have a system that has this sort of the training wheels to help you prevent the highs and help prevent the lows. So that's why you're doing looping. And, so here's what the, the, the phone Dexcom reports look like. And you can select the date range, you can see the time and range in there, and you get the little AGP report. If you're young and have really good eyes, you can see small still, you can look at them in your phone. Otherwise, you can go into the settings and set up you know, to, little reminders so that um, it's going to send you the reports. I think it's profile over there on the right hand side now. This is the old Clarity app. And then we like looking at data in Tide Pool. So we're going to take a look at Tide Pool and then we'll talk about how do you get your loop data <coughs> from your phone into Tide Pool and then take a look at your data and sort of be able to see your data in Tide Pool as well. Now what Loop, what Typo doesn't do is it doesn't capture your pump settings. So back when we had people upload their pumps to Typo, the pump settings would go into Typo automatically as well. So when I'm collecting data, I need to reach out to, to our patients and I'll say either keep track of know you know the settings and send it in a text file so here's someone who did a hybrid and this is somebody that's coming in tomorrow and so for the insulin sensitivities and all those different time frames they sent a screenshot of the insulin sensitivities so I collect the screenshots and I put them together into you know one PDF document and then some of them where that's simpler it's sort of just a depression range and what kind of insulin model they have and suspend threshold. And that's just in a text document. So it comes to me in different ways, but we need to know your settings so we can help you adjust some of the settings. All right, so we got that. I'm gonna stop share and I'm gonna start over again. Um, I could stop with any questions with that. Yeah, there, there, there's an interesting question um, about um, whether you've been approached by Tide Pool to develop Tide Pool Loop practitioner training resources since you use it so extensively. I, I've done a webinar with them. They, they've been they've been actually doing a great job, and actually, we're going to go to Tide Pool right now. And. 
one of the things, and so this is a tide pool homepage, and tide pool for telemedicine. They have a great number of webinars, um, clinician training, a person with diabetes training, and they have a great um, archive of webinars. And somewhere down way in here, you can see how on a webinar that I did about collecting data. There we are. So they have that. And basically, there's the home page. This is where you go in. You either log in there, you sign up there for patients and how it works. And there's a little um, you know, app that you use for phone. And, but we're going to talk more about connecting, there's a Tide Pool app that you get into the iPhone app store that you download it. And there's a way to connect it through health in order to send your looping data directly into Tide Pool. And the way to find out about all that, you go into support. And now you'll notice that if you go into support, you sort of can't come into Tide Pool again. You can't like click on the logo to go back. And so you have to go to tidepool.org again to get back on in there. So you go into the search bar and you type in loop. And you'll get a couple of suggestions. Number one, you may know that Tide Pool is working to get an FDA approved version of loop up and running. And so they're doing this great work. And if you're interested in doing that, then you sign up for them for, you know, keep, keep me up to date on what's going on with the Tide Pool and Loop. But they're really actively working with the FDA about the do-it-yourself community. They sort of know what, what you folks are doing. And they're working to go through the steps that are needed to get approved by the FDA. So if you want to support their mission, then you can, you can go in and do that. They're also a nonprofit, and you can donate today. <laughs> um, so you can do that. But the other thing to do is that how to upload your data with Tidepool Mobile. So you all are techies, and you've managed to build your loop system, so you know how to sort of like go in and download now, to follow instructions, you go to, um, to you know, Tide Pool Mobile, you get the app, you sign into the account, you need an account first to do that, and you, you, you do that on the first page that I showed you. And you go through, you tap permissions, and you want to sync the health data, and you connect the Tide Pool app to send the data to the cloud, to the website. And then I'll show you what that looks like. And you can see some of this data on your phone as well. Let's see. If you... So here's what it looks like. And when there's a note and there's a note with data, then you can see what happens when you eat breakfast with granola and almond milk. So this is living on your phone. And so it's, it's pretty cool. And so, and it's also what we use to get the data into the, the clinic account. So James Jellyfish is one of the people, Type o has lots of people with type 1 diabetes who works, work there. And they sometimes they share their data and they've all took these little fishy names. And so James Jellyfish is one of them. We're going to take a look at Dave Dolphin. And I think this is our... Your, your loop basal branch, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, if this, you know, where you, the, the basal is going on and off, and there's these little bol auto boluses in between meal that's going on. And so this is a new version of loop that, you know, I'm starting to see while well, people are doing this basal branching thing, and what in the world is that? And so this was suddenly new to me. And then Mary Rose talked about notes. And so in that Tide Pool app that I showed you, those notes were associated, and that note shows up here. And you write your notes, and it shows up in your data. And so Dave Dolphin would write a note. The note would you 
they hover over it, it would say a note from Dave Dolphin that I ate granola with almond milk. And then this actually Mary Rose put in. And so the account is a clinic account. And so we have Dr. Peter's name in there. And so this is how Mary Rose works with people to provide them feedback. And do you want to say a few things about how you use notes, Mary Rose, why, why we're up and talking yeah. about So usually it's the patient writing me notes. Um, and then in between visits, um, you know, if we're going back and forth, I can write notes back to the patient. But most of this is done for a week or two before our visit so that when we find a high blood sugar there, the patient writes a note, oh, this is what happened, I ate this, and this is how I counted it, or, oh, I played tennis, look what happened, oh my gosh, I went so high, could we work on that custom uh, override for tennis, that other override didn't work, you know, so that, because when you're usually looking at data in dailies like this, um, patients don't remember what they ate. They don't remember how long they exercised. So in the moment, they just go onto their Tide Pool app and they write in what they ate, they write in what the exercise, and then that goes directly onto their data here. And then we can see it. Or sometimes they'll just email me and say, can you get on real quick? I had a moment last night, I don't understand it. Um, I was high all night, um, and then I look in, I see what they treated their low blood sugar with, and they ate eight kind bars after they had their orange juice. So this is what caused the high blood sugars after, uh, during the night. So, you know, so we find some really interesting things, we can really communicate well, and we are communicating with the data right there, and with you know, seeing what the timing was of that bolus, you know, and we, we see your diabetes self-management behaviors on there and the things that you're struggling with, you know, so it's really helpful. How do you, how do, you do this? Um, uh, assuming you have more than 10 patients. If we have a screen share feature on our telehealth portal. But okay. you're on a telehealth video, visit with the patient, we're talking, and I say, okay, it's time, we're going to screen share your data. We look at the right hand side, we pull out the trends and the time and range, and then we look on the left side and we look at their diabetes self management and all their notes. And we scroll through day after day after day. Before we scroll through these dailies, though, we look at the trend, that overall trend uh, bucket that's on the upper left and we pull out what the problems might be in the visits that we're gonna focus on. So it's not instant, it's not someone's reviewing it every day or if I send you a message and say, it's been a crazy day. Yeah, I can then I can go in and view it on my own, but usually we view it during our visit. And I have one hour visits with patients. So we can get into the minutia of your diabetes self-management, we can get into the minutia of all your data. We can look at your sites. You know, we get a lot of time together that you don't usually get uh, with most providers. So, we, we've been discussing this as you know, as we um, and thank you, Cassidy, for this. Um, as more and more people are using any kind of loop system, um, will they need to be seen more frequently? Um, to see the impact of incorrect settings, or will they, will be someone be overviewing, or will there be expert systems reviewing on a regular basis? I think all pump patients need this, you know, and it depends on the patient. Um, I think people do benefit from more frequent visits with a diabetes educator. We see in all the data since the 80s that uh, more frequent touch points help diabetes con control and management. Um, we even have some real type A's that have perfect control, but it just makes their, their coping skill, their coping and their depression and their anxiety better just to see their data, like once every couple of months to just really look at it with me, you know, so I don't think loop, maybe in the beginning, yes, you require more of these types of remote monitoring visits, but once you're good, you're good for you know, as long as you're you're happy and your time is in range and you're seeing your endocrinologist every three months, then you would just see me periodically, maybe a couple times a year. Uh, but yes, in the beginning, I think it's important to have somebody like me or Meg or Mark to work with 
to start, it, I think it makes it an easier transition. How do you how do you think people should work with their endocrinologists who aren't as proactive as your practice, which is probably ninety percent of the practices out here? Well, you could ask them if they would start up a tide pool account if you could log on there prior to the visits. You could bring, I've brought my computer into my own doctor. I don't have diabetes, but for other things to look at labs and things like that, like you can bring your computer in, you can have tide pool up. You could start looking at your reports with your endo. You could teach your endo how to look at reports. Um, you know, so you can start, you know, getting your clarity data and, 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 and printing it out, bringing that in. Um, and just, you know, take the initiative. And we're, like I said, we're all in this together. We're learning from you, you're learning from us, and that exchange of information is, is, is key. You know? That's the rarity of your office, it's really rare. Um, I, have, I have intelligent doctors, most of us do, and I bring reports and they flip through and go, okay. They just don't, they're trained and they're, they're not trained. I, I teach people, that I'm, I'm doing this presentation tonight to teach you all how to read your own reports. And so I love Tidepool because you get to teach yourself because you can look at yesterday and you can say, well, what happened here? And what did I do? What did I eat? And then you can see how the person was going up you know, before they bolus. And so... You know, and then they say, oh, I, you know, I gave my insulin late. And is that what your note says? Yes. <laughs> and so you can see that. You can learn from that. And so I teach people how to read their reports. And I, that's why I mentioned getting your own clarity report as well, so that you can see your data and, and review what you did and remember what you did. And it's, it's, feedback you're making the best guess that you can at the time in any given day but you know you you know you, you're doing your best and you want to go back and take a take a take a look at it to learn from the data as well so yeah. that's what I think that. people I think because of telehealth and screen share and type pool, people are learning how to look at their own data and I'm able to get them to engage in looking at their data with me. And they really, really enjoy it and appreciate it. And they learn so much from it. Um, but yes, we are a rare practice and type one is a rare disease. So find someone you can work with, find someone that you can talk to, uh, you know, educating through these types of things is great. Uh, Mark will, t you know, teach you more on the reading the, the, the reports, but yeah, we're, you know, it's not easy to find somebody that can do this with you. I understand that. It's very rare. Um, have you thought of doing an educational video for the medical community? No, like Mark said, uh, Tidepool is doing some really great webinars to educate the, um, the community, uh, our community on this. Yeah, but they're seen as a vendor, and it's interesting. You guys are actually doing it, uh, mm -hmm. kind of a different perspective, and it's... You know, I think once it's FDA approved, maybe we would get some ability to do uh, some loop teaching, but I think because it's not FDA approved yet, there isn't a lot of support for that. Got it. I want Meg to talk a little bit about how she uses the type pool data and the notes with her nutrition patient as well. I know she has them, you know, I, I see data with her and I see patients coming in and they're like 10 notes about everything that they ate. So Meg, do you want to talk a little bit about how you use notes as well? Um, yes, I, I get, I love the notes because it really helps people identify um, a, a situation that, you know, they wouldn't remember if it wasn't written down. Um, and they communicate like what they ate, what they took. Um, if they're not on a pump, um, they'll tell me how much they bowl is. It, it varies depending on the, on the individual. Um, but it is so helpful because you can look at what they ate 
and then you can look at you know what they what they estimated and i'll review things with them um and then we look at what happened and it, it's just a great teaching tool and again like I, mark says like i'll have people have like you know 10 notes going all the way across but it's the more information we have the more we can you know customize it for that person and you know, every day is, is, you know, a full-time job for, for people who have type 1 diabetes. So we're trying to help in any way we can and collaborate with them to make it a little bit easier. Um, and again, looking at, you know, overall nutrition, I, I'm a big component of not just one meal, but, you know, what, what does your nutrition look over three days? And, um, and again, I'm a big, big pusher of, of um, fruits and veggies. Um, just again, to get your, your nutrition in, but it's very helpful. Um, and I, I realize, in, um, you know, some, some people, some physicians or other practitioners, they don't look at their data. Um, maybe they don't know how, or I'm not sure, but I, I've heard that over the years that, you know, people will tell me that, oh yeah, he doesn't even look at it. So I don't keep it. Um, but we do, um, and again, the more information, the better we can help and collaborate with you to make a difference in, in your overall day and make yourself feel as best as possible. Another, another thing that I notice on the dailies when I'm looking at this with a patient, is I can see where they've over-treated their lows. Yes. Or how they've troubleshooting pump failures. You know, it's not necessarily a loop failure. It's a good old fashioned pump failure where the site gets kinked or clogged and it's not infusing insulin. So I could see how they're troubleshooting lows and how they're tr tr uh, troubleshooting highs. Um, I could see the timing of the bolus. I'm seeing a lot in our older patients, they forget to bolus. Um, so, uh, and you know, we can refine those settings and make little setting changes if we have determined that you're carb counting properly. Um, so there's a lot of um, teaching and coaching and just reassurance and reinforcement that we can do on this platform with our patients through remote monitoring and telehealth visits. So, the question is very specific to our community since probably most of us use Night Scout. Some of us use additionally tide pool for historical data. It's the only place you can get your your daily dose, your total daily dose. But you know, tide pool also doesn't show you IOB. So, if a patient came in using Night Scout, uh, would you work with that patient with the Night Scout reports, which also have notes and uh, information as well? We have some patients on tide on uh, Night Scout, and I have looked at their Night Scout, um, but I also encourage them to get on Tide Pool so we can do a lot of this. Uh, I think what Meg and I were talking about before we logged on was, um, you know, and if you look at the basic view here, you can see your total daily dose and things like that. Um, but what Meg and I were talking about here was we help patients see the broader perspective and step back. Sometimes you guys get stuck in the minutia of being lost in a low or lost in a high and in the daily grunt of it all. And so what we try to do with Tide Pool is just step get back at a broader perspective of how you're doing and your trends. And, you know, a lot of times you're doing a lot better than you think you are. Um, you just had a bad night, you know? Um, so I think that's what's helpful when we're looking at your numbers. We're looking at more of a broader perspective. You're more like troubleshooting in the moment. And that's why Night Scout's so helpful to you. Um, and, and I get that, you know? So um, yeah, I can see how they both would work nicely together. Other apps like uh, Loop Follow or SugarMate, which gives you interesting uh, dashboard have you used i don't have experience with those do you guys can, can i finish with showing you the navigation of type pool and then we can get some news some additional questions down the road sure we'll let you do that mark <laughs> so take a take a look at it and there's a daily view and then you'll notice you may have seen me hit these arrows and this is like midnight to midnight again and noon in the middle here. And you can also 
if you often have these nighttime issues where, you know, a lot of us, you know, we see that dinner time going into night, you know, and tight pool and then looping is really great for dealing, you know, getting your, your glucose under control at nighttime. But if this is the problem area, the dinner area, then you can put midnight right in the middle and you can go back and see how that person did last night. And so is this a consistent high for dinner or is it a one-time Saturday night fling? And so you, know, you want to take a look at that. And so sometimes this is the, way, the other way of taking a look at it. And that's you grab the screen and you move it you know, to, to, to fine tune it to whatever time period that you're looking at. This will take you to the most recent data. And Dave is currently not syncing. That is an issue that we run into with um, the technical people. Sometimes we have to have them go into the app and either open up the app and then manually sync the health data. And that's a little button in the, in the app and you tap on the left hand hamburger menu on the left hand screen and then you'll see a little prompt to say sync health data and that other um, list that i gave you was a way to, to trouble the data and, and an issue as well um so we're seeing these daily time in the range settings and we looked at that big group of looking at like three months now one month, 14 days, whatever. As we scroll through here, you see it started out with 56%. Sorry, I get it. I always point to the screen and realize that you can't see that. And so the time and range, the screen bar is changing. You now every single day it updates. So you get this daily feedback. And there's again that old um, coefficient variability, the vari of the variation. So that is, these are the variation numbers. Uh, it keeps track of your carbs, your total insulin, your average glucose for the day, how much time you spend in each bucket. So you get this daily review uh, in sort of a day daily feedback on how you're doing. And I sort of like Dave Dolphin because he's in, you know, generally he's in the 70% range, time and range. So, you know, he went a little bit high there, but, you know, he's sort of in the general buckets and he has days like this, you know, and every now and then you're going to see that you hit 100%. And so if you like move it a little bit, oh, he still has it over there. But sometimes if you mention it a little bit, you can actually get a good 100% number for yourself just to celebrate from time to time. Um, but you can see how it varies. There's good days, there are bad days, and you're trying to figure out well, what happened on that good day? How can I have more of those good days? And fewer of the, the, the battling ups and downs. So the other screen that's really useful for loopers is this is the trend view. And this is that sort of cloud report that we're looking at. We saw <coughs> the Libre cloud report and the Dexcom cloud report this is the tide pool cloud report. And this green line is the median, daily average. If you hover over it, you get, it freaks out on you. And it shows you, you know, some of the individual days and up and down. But you can also say, do I want 100% of the time? Do I want my outliers? You say, no, this is 80% of my readings. Or if I just want to see that green, that's the median. And you know, mostly half the time, I'm you know in that, and so that that is grand. And then, if you want to see your outliers as well, then you do that, and you can see it for for one week, and you can see these numbers change. And so, if you had a good week or a bad week, or if you really want to see sort of you know, the bigger picture. And then you can see you know this GMI number, which is you know, you're equivalent to the A1C. That pops up in the variability. Sometimes if you don't have enough data, you won't get that GMI in there. And so you see, you'll need that. And then there's ways if you really like, if you're like a, a weekend warrior and you want to see how you behave on the weekend, 
versus the weekdays, then you can take a look at that. And I know somebody who's like a Sunday runner, so they only want to look at like their Sunday data when they're running. And so you can, you can do that. And now this is possible. I don't know anyone who's ever really done that, but it's possible to turn, to turn that on. Um, I think we get it, and I think we understand what tide pool can do and the data you can see. And, and you know, I keep coming back to we're kind of more of a Night Scout uh, group, but more interested in how you make your decisions um, and what what information you follow. But I think we we got this on, on how to use tide pool, and I think that's, that's pretty remarkable. There was a question about... Um, time and range way back there was a question about why is 70 to 180 a range that it seems to be standard the the international group because that is considered normal normal glucose and you know, we certainly see people who try to have tighter settings than that and they try to go between 60 and 120 and so then we've seen that, that they're you know, often having lots of lows as well, they're fighting those lows. And so, you know, we worry about people who get below 70 and having low reactions. We want to sort of, you know, keep people and, you know, so that they're not going below 70 a lot or that they're really sort of working to bump up so they can see how the loop, you know, kicked in and then went down to 64, but, but then bounced back up. Yeah. I think the concern is more at the high end. I think a lot of loopers that we talk to don't think 180 is a, a terribly reasonable range. It's, 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 a, it's a decent range. And, and you know, we worry more about people who you know, are fighting too much to stay within a really tight range and one of the, the advantages of these closed loop systems is that you get these really good numbers without doing as much work. They have you no know, more of their energy and thought process that's available to live their life and not just you know managing their diabetes all the time. So that's one of the things that we hear a lot from people who are in the hybrid closed loop systems. Okay, got it. Thank you. I see there's one other question about um, what percentage of your, your patients come to control their own settings well? That's a Mary Rose question. To, to making their own, to creating their own setting. Yeah. Uh, I can't get, I can't, I've never done any research on that. I see the patients that need help with their settings. We do have a lot of patients that make little tiny adjustments in their settings. Um, after, you know, learning this over and over, there's a certain type of patient. Um, I, the, the majority of the patients that I see like my help with the settings. Um, and that's probably why they keep coming back to see me. Um, I am talking them through my thought process, showing them the data that I'm using to make that decision in hopes that eventually they will take over the reins and know when to change their own settings. But, you know, Anne sees them every three months. Uh, Donna, our nurse practitioner, sees them every three months. They're changing settings with the patients. And we're, you know, so, you know, I, I really don't know how many people and when they change their settings. Um, it's, you know, I would say maybe 50% of our patients change, you know, make little adjustments in between their visits. Um, it just really depends on the patient and where they're at. Got it. Um, thank you. I really hope that you can do a video that helps some, I'd take a video to my doctor's office to show how you do this. I, I they, they're wonderful doctors and they just will not talk about they just will go that's really good well i think the thing to understand is there's like i don't know last i knew there was about five thousand endocrinologists in the whole country yeah and it's such a very small percentage of them even do type 1 diabetes they like to do 
thyroid. <laughs> and um, so you've got a small percentage that does diabetes. Then you've got an even smaller percentage of their diabetic patients that have, and I should say people with diabetes or I'll get in trouble, that have type one. Okay. So if they even do diabetes, they do mostly type two diabetes. Okay. So if you want someone like us, you have to find someone that is subspecialized or find a diabetes educator that works with pumps, you know, and then have your regular endocrinologist uh, that's maybe an association in the same health system as that diabetes educator is. So nurse, diabetes educator, pump specialists, we really know how to fuss with settings and sites and pumps. We know all the ins and outs of the, you know, customized settings and things like that. And we can work very nicely with an endo that just does de general diabetes. So it can, you know, that could, that could be a nice fit. You're, you're a rare, you're a rare group. And I remember saying that to you when you invited us and I said, do you know what we're doing? And you go, oh, yeah, we know what you're doing. Uh, yeah. So our advisory board meeting last year, as part of our education initiative, uh, decided to, you know, develop our expertise in loop and to go out to the greater loop community within Los Angeles and Southern California to try to connect with you and give you some support. And so we did a really great community event with you. It's wonderful to see your uh, population growing and to be included in this tonight. And we hope that we can continue to collaborate with you and help you in this way. Thank you. And everyone should know that um, Dr. Ann Peters has agreed to come talk with us in October. It'll be October 18th. Um, and we'll come back to that issue of how do we work with our endocrinologists to help them help us the way you guys help your patients. Because it, Maybe it, you have a couple of patients that have sort of cracked through the the difficulty with their endo that could talk about how they did it and approached it, you know? Haven't. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I wish I could tell you that's happened, but it hasn't. Um, and we were talking internationally as well, and it doesn't happen. So um, we're looking forward to that. I really appreciate the time, and I really appreciate your help. It, it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Joanne. Websites and where we put the information out, I know you were talking a lot about videos, but we, we do a newsletter, and so we're often putting our new information out. We always do a review of what's new from the APA meeting and our studies, uh, study updates, um, talking about time and range and you know GMI and how we're doing the telehealth visits now. And so this is sort of a review of what I talked about tonight. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, I really appreciate the time. Um, this will be out, and I see some watch parties going on. So thank you, thank you. Um, I hope you all have a good evening, and I really appreciate your help. Great to meet you all. Thank you for having us. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.